I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, two great speakers, both of them also good friends and long-standing collaborators. It's a real pleasure to see them both here. Uh, the first is uh, Bruno Martorano. Bruno is an assistant professor uh, at the University of Maastricht, uh, the Graduate School of Governance and UNU Merit. Before joining Maastricht, Bruno worked at ETH in Zurich and at the Institute of Development Studies in Brighton, where we started our long-standing collaboration, and also before at the UNICEF Innocenti Center in Florence. Lina is a professor of political geography and conflict at the University of Sussex, uh, where we met. Uh, she, has, uh, she worked previously before joining Sussex at Trinity College Dublin and at, uh, uh, at PRIO, the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. Lina is the director of the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, the ACLET project which is familiar to anyone working on conflict uh, and political violence. And it's been a tremendous public good for everyone in this field. And we're very grateful for that. Uh, and it's also a large part of the presentation that Bruno will do in just a minute. Welcome to both of you. Um, as usual, uh, the way we've been doing this uh, webinars is Bruno will speak for about 20 minutes. Kleena will respond uh, for about 10 minutes. And after that, we have time for Q&A. Uh, so uh, please uh, keep posting your questions on Q&A. I am uh, monitoring and I will compile and address them to the speakers. And if we have a little bit of spare time at the end, uh, I'll try to unmute some of you maybe and you can ask your questions directly. So let's see how the, that goes with time. But uh, without further ado, welcome uh, to you both and uh, over to Bruno. Uh, thanks, thanks, Patricia. Thanks uh, for uh, this uh, uh, for your uh, introduction, and thanks to you and uh, you and you wider for organizing this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, today, I would like to to, to talk about uh, our recent work on uh, uh, basically on uh, uh, the, the, the cost of pandemics in terms of uh, social and political uh, stability. In particular, in our recent uh, uh, paper, uh, we uh, investigate uh, uh, we investigate about uh, the uh, consequences of policy responses to COVID-19 inequality and inequality on protest in the context of uh, uh, USA. But uh, let me to introduce uh, our work. Uh, we know that uh, COVID-19 is a global uh, disaster that has taken the world uh, by surprise and many governments and uh, most of the governments were absolutely unprepared to this uh, uh, shock, of course. Uh, as reported in the official statistics, the first cases of COVID-19 were recorded in uh, uh, Wuhan in China in December 2019, but soon uh, the, the virus spread uh, to the rest of, uh, of the world. As the number of cases were increasing across the world, we also uh, uh, could observe that the uh, social discontent uh, uh, started to increase uh, in uh, the population. In particular, uh, we can observe that the number of protests uh, increased over the last year, in particular, the increase of about the 30% between January 2020 and January 2021. In the USA, in particular, uh, were recorded uh, uh, many, several uh, protests. In particular, they started uh, in uh, uh, COVID-related protests uh, protest started since mid-April 2020 uh, in Michigan, uh, but then they started also to, to happen in other states such as Utah, uh, uh, and uh, many different states, including the less conservative ones such as uh, California and uh, uh, Colorado. So, uh, but why did protest uh, rise uh, when uh, the, the pandemic was uh, so uh, rampant? So we think that uh, it's not enough just uh, to link uh, the, uh, the, the, the stringency of uh, policy implemented to, uh, to, to limit the spread of the virus uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the 
increasing number of protests. Uh, but we think our hypothesis in this work is that COVID-19 is exposing existing inequalities. And in particular, the health shock and the, the policy implemented to reduce the, uh, to, 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 to deal with uh, the, the virus uh, basically uh, may uh, generate uh, some uh, important uh, economic cost. Uh, and uh, most importantly, these economic costs uh, are higher in the, the most uh, uh, unequal uh, areas. In particular, in these areas, it's uh, uh, possible that uh, the feeling of uh, injustice, feeling of and fairness uh, basically are increasing and uh, increasing. And the, what uh, is uh, explained in the theory basically is that uh, when uh, these uh, uh, feelings uh, uh, achieve a certain uh, threshold, uh, basically we can observe that individuals and groups uh, start to react engaging in, in, uh, in different forms of political engagement, including uh, civil protest uh, and uh, demonstrations. So against this background, uh, the aim of uh, the objective of uh, our work is to empirically demonstrate the role of existing, uh, uh, pre-existing inequality in explaining the relationship between policy restrictions uh, against COVID-19 and the incidence of protest in uh, Europe. To do that, uh, we build uh, uh, a data set including different information uh, for uh, more than 3,000 uh, uh, USA counties from uh, 50 states uh, uh, and uh, the District of uh, uh, Columbia. And in particular, for each county, we uh, added the time invariant information on uh, weekly aggregate uh, uh, data on COVID-related protest events, weekly uh, information on, uh, on COVID-related policies, and the information on the level of uh, Gini index in 2019. Uh, again, uh, the period of analysis uh, is uh, 2020. So, but let me to explain a little bit more about our data. All uh, the uh, protest events uh, are recorded uh, uh, by ACLED and uh, the Bridging Divides Initiative uh, under the new project uh, uh, USA Crisis Monitor. And in particular, this data set is very important for us because uh, it uh, reports information about dates, actors, locations of protest in uh, the USA and uh, uh, give us the possibility of distinguished uh, COVID-related protests to other types of protests happening in the USA. So basically in this uh, uh, work, we are able in this way to clear, clearly understand the impact of these policy restrictions to protest uh, related to COVID-19. The second important uh, source of information that we are using in our study is uh, uh, related to the COVID, uh, uh, COVID uh, related policies. And in particular, these information are from the Oxford COVID 19 government response tracker that uh, reports uh, systematic information on lockdown style measures. Uh, and in particular, it scores uh, the stringency, the restrictiveness of uh, these uh, uh, measures. In particular, there are 20 indicators. Uh, some of these indicators are aggregated in a uh, stringency index uh, that ranges between one and 100, with 100 represented a situation of uh, complete uh, uh, lockdown. So if we start to pull together this information, we can observe some initial interesting results. In particular, the level of uh, the stringency of policy was much higher in uh, the uh, states in the coast, but also we can observe that uh, these uh, areas also observed a higher number of uh, protests. But this is only a small piece uh, to explain uh, the uh, protest in, recorded in the USA in the uh, recent year. And to add to, 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 to understand better about this complex uh, dynamic, uh, this complex relationship, 
we need also to understand the role of inequality. In particular, we know that inequality is high in USA and is much higher than in other uh, developed uh, countries. But uh, if we look at the level of inequality uh, at subnational level, is it possible to observe that uh, uh, inequality ranges between 0 0.30 and uh, 0.71? So there are huge differences across USA. Uh, countries. So, but once again, looking at a uh, uh, map of USA, we can observe that uh, the most unequal areas are in the coast, and in particular in this case, the most unequal counties are in the southeast. Uh, so let's move to our uh, empirical uh, strategy, and in particular, uh, uh, we discussed it so far about, uh, uh, we just pulled the different informations, uh, but we want to understand empirically uh, the relationship between uh, the stringency of uh, anti-COVID-19 uh, uh, policies uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, protest incidents uh, in uh, areas characterized by different levels of inequality in uh, USA. In particular, we formalized this, uh, uh, this uh, model through this uh, equation in which the, main, the dependent variable is a uh, dummy variable assuming the value one uh, if a protest related to COVID-19 happened at county level in a certain week. Huh? And uh, uh, the two uh, variable, uh, independent variable of interest are the stringency index and the interaction of the stringency uh, index with the level of inequality in each USA county. In particular, we are interested uh, policy may translate into variation in protest activities in areas uh, characterized by different levels of uh, inequality. But uh, it's important to highlight that the previous equations implies that the effect of uh, the stringency of policy on protest changes in a linear manner with the level of inequality. However, we want to uh, ensure the necessary flexibility to uh, our data, to our model, and to capture this uh, non-linearity. So basically, we replaced the Gini index with the uh, quintiles of uh, inequality, and we interact the levels of uh, policy stringency with uh, quintiles of uh, the Gini index, as formalized uh, through this uh, equation. So if we move to the results, comparing the two different models, we can observe, uh, first of all, that uh, we can conclude that uh, the effect of stringency uh, increases, uh, basically increases with the level of inequality. So the level of protest, uh, the probability of protest is higher. But we observed, thanks to the results uh, related to uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, equation number two, that uh, the effect of stringency is not significant uh, on uh, areas characterized by low level of inequality, but it started to be significant and positive only in areas uh, in the most unequal uh, areas. So in particular, according to our results, we can uh, show that uh, uh, one, uh, the, the probability uh, increase uh, one standard deviation uh, uh, of change in the stringency index lead to an increase of the probability of protests of about 6%. So we know, we are aware that there could be several problems in terms of endogeneity, of course, with uh, uh, our analysis. And to reduce this concern, uh, we tried to implement a different strategy. For example, we reduced the concerns in terms of uh, uh, omitted variable bias using uh, county and state fixed uh, effects. We also, uh, to reduce the issue in terms of uh, uh, reverse casualty, we uh, uh, we highlight in our work that we are uh, considering the role of pre-existing inequality. 
which basically refer to the Gini index recorded in 2019. We, the trends in the probability of protests are parallel in areas with different levels of stringency as well as different levels of inequality. So our results is not explained by previous uh, uh, trends in the outcome of variable. And also we finally instrument uh, the stringency index uh, uh, and in particular using uh, the average number of new COVID uh, cases recorded in neighboring states or the average level of policy stringency in border states. And in particular, uh, uh, of course, for reason of time, I cannot explain the idea behind, but uh, uh, I want to show the results. So let's basically uh, um, explain uh, once again that our results are robust, uh, uh, and in particular, the coefficient of interest. Uh, I'm reporting here the interaction between stringency index and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the highest, uh, uh, the higher, the areas, uh, 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 the quintile uh, number five. So we can observe the coefficients is uh, almost uh, the same. We change it uh, um, only uh, a little bit, uh, and it's always statistically significant. So, but we tried also to understand uh, the uh, underlying mechanisms. Uh, uh, and in particular, we try to understand uh, why the, this, uh, the, the, the uh, stringency of uh, policy against COVID-19 tend to affect uh, uh, the number of protests in the most uh, unequal areas, investigating in particular uh, the role of economic factors. We know that uh, the policy measures, the, the crisis and the policy measure to contain the COVID-19 have generated the important uh, economic consequences. In particular, in uh, April 2020, unemployed, uh, unemployment uh, uh, reached its peak since uh, uh, the end of the Second World uh, War with an average level uh, uh, of about 15%. Uh, uh, and importantly, it's necessary to highlight that the most uh, hit uh, groups uh, were uh, the most vulnerable ones, uh, such as the temporary workers and uh, members of uh, minorities. Also, if we compare a small uh, uh, business activities against uh, the big companies, so uh, there are some uh, uh, information, some uh, data showing that the most affected the one are uh, once again uh, the uh, small, uh, the smaller activities. And in particular, as reported by the Fortune magazine, uh, by September 2020, uh, about uh, 100,000 commercial establishments shut down permanently. So basically, there are some evidence, some data showing the importance of the economic channel. And to understand the, the, the role of economic factors in explaining uh, uh, our results, we just uh, replace it in our main estimation of the dependent variable with a number of uh, uh, economic uh, uh, outcomes, such as the number of uh, small business uh, uh, activities uh, that uh, opened uh, in the recent days, the revenue of these uh, uh, business activities, uh, cons uh, consumer expenditure, as well as the level of unemployment. And when we are uh, replacing these uh, different uh, uh, outcome, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, when we are using these uh, different variables, we can observe uh, once again that uh, the impact of the crisis, uh, and in particular the uh, impact of policy responses uh, to uh, COVID-19 is uh, stronger in the most unequal areas. In particular, the, uh, there are negative consequences in the number of uh, new small uh, business activities in uh, their revenue, in the level of consumption, as well as uh, in uh, the level of uh, uh, unemployment. And in our understanding, this is uh, the reason behind this increasing level of dissatisfaction that is uh, leading this, uh, uh, to uh, this increasing level of social and political instability in, in these uh, areas. Uh, 
So we also try the two include to analyze other social and political uh, factors. Uh, and in particular, our results show that uh, protests are more likely to take place in the most unequal areas where trust in the presidents and uh, uh, satisfaction with democracy are lower than in other areas, uh, as well as in uh, areas where uh, the levels of social trust and civic engagement is uh, higher. And these results are not surprising because are in line with the expectation of the theory. So let me to conclude, uh, in particular, uh, our results show that the implementation of policy restrictions to contain uh, the spread of the virus lead to uh, increases in the, in the incidence and in the number of protests in USA counties, but only in areas with the highest levels, uh, recording the highest levels of uh, inequality. And these results, of course, if we want to link these results to the theory, they validate a long-standing theory of uh, civil unrest that emphasize the role of inequality motivating deprived groups and individuals to take the street. Also, uh, in this work, uh, we emphasize uh, that uh, these uh, changes are mainly explained by changes in economic conditions in counties with higher uh, disparities. We think also that our work has some uh, uh, interesting policy implications. Uh, in particular, once again, this work highlights uh, the issue of inequality, the fact that we must act, we must fight inequality, especially in good time, to avoid that uh, in uh, uh, the time of crisis, such as our time, inequality magnifies, amplifies the negative consequences of the uh, shock. Moreover, uh, we highlight the role of economic channels to explain uh, the rising level of uh, protest, and this uh, would suggest, let's say, the fact that implementing uh, restrictions to the mobility of people, we also should uh, implement new social protection measures to buffer the uh, consequences, the negative consequences of the crisis and uh, uh, ensuring uh, uh, and promoting uh, better living conditions of uh, people affected by, uh, most, more affected by the crisis. Finally, I would like to also refer to an important uh, uh, point. In particular, we are observing here the consequences of the crisis and policies in the short term. But we know from a previous crisis that uh, the, 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 these types of shock could generate long-term consequences, especially on political outcomes, leading to more social and political instability, conflicts between different groups, polarization, and rising of uh, uh, populism. So that's all for uh, my presentation. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Bruno. Um, perfect timing. And uh, Kleena, over to you. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, one second. I, I, oh, great, I'm not unmuted. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, firstly, thank you very much. I hope everybody can see that. Um, I would like to, um, to definitely uh, just at the moment thank, of course, um, Patricia for inviting me to this very interesting session and uh, the opportunity to read the paper, which was excellent. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ACLED's work on um, the coronavirus pandemic and also, of course, our new work featured in your paper about the U.S. Um, crisis monitor, which has now become effectively ACLED's U.S. coding as it continues. Um, they, they both, I want to uh, be specifically clear, they're both being um, led by Dr. Rudabay Kishi, who's in the audience. So any specific questions about either of those things should be directed towards Rudabay, but I will, I will hopefully represent her well in these discussions. Um, they're both excellent projects. We're very proud of both. And they came during a very busy year while we were um, 
while we were expanding globally and then of course taking a much deeper investigation into the US. Um, and in fact, that came at a fortuitous time. It wasn't planned to coincide with um, a time when the US had more demonstrations than the top other two countries combined, which I believe is India and Pakistan. Um, it was really quite shocking the amount of um, social movement um, and of course how it's morphing even now into new subject matter as as the people who've organized locally now want to keep it and keep it going because it has had such important implications. So um, I will go through some of these uh, reports that have recently come out. This is a national emergency, how COVID-19 is fueling unrest in the US. It seems appropriate given the subject matter today. That came out uh, in March. Uh, there's also this, um, this work here, excuse me. Uh, there's also this work here, which is our annual report, which is able to, um, to note exactly the ways in which conflict has shifted from 2019 through 2020. Um, less, less, um, less definite as, um, as people might think, uh, in part because coronavirus, while incredibly important around the world, has had very different effects. And in some cases, like here in Ethiopia, where I am, um, it has not been a feature in any of the conflicts that have increased in the last six months to a year, um, despite it being now a growing threat in some of the more urban areas. So I think we sometimes risk overstating the impact of coronavirus on existing social movements and existing conflicts where they are occurring because they are, in fact, having such a huge effect on our day-to-day -day lives um, in, uh, in often Western places. And then this report, which might be especially important if people are interested in the effects of coronavirus, it's called a year of COVID. Sorry, everybody. This, this, this happens here. Um, let me make sure that I'm still sharing my screen and that everybody can still hear me. I was getting back on there. Yeah, can everybody still there. hear? Sorry about that. That really does happen all the yeah. time. <laughs> that, that, that will happen again. I'm just going to say it now. I'm going to apologize, blanket apology for all the times it's going to happen between now and 10 minutes from now. Um, but this came out this month from April 2020, and it's uh, it focuses on the impact of the global conflict and demonstration trends. And I just want to mention a few of those things now because I think they're relevant to what we're talking about. Um, so despite the pandemic, of course, demonstrations increased worldwide last year, which is in some ways a surprising um, conclusion for many people. Um, there was an initial drop at the start of the health crisis, which we discussed and overall demonstration activity rose 7% last year. Um, and that is, that is very much in keeping with the same sourcing guidelines. Um, and all countries covered um, by ACLED, there has been effectively 93% of all demonstrations have been peaceful with 7% met by some form of intervention. Um, and that's been an especially important indication in the US. Uh, in fact, as we found 93% of the BLM or the social justice protests were peaceful. Um, and that came at a time when, when demonstration was incredibly politicized within the states. And I think it's very important to think about the ways in which, um, as, as Bruno has mentioned, kind of grievance, geography, and new crises have coalesced in the US in a very unique way. Um, that has led us to be able to look very clearly at the economic ramifications of, um, of a new crisis hitting a hitting an already, I would say, disturbed political environment and how they're building on each other. Um, so, but demonstrations were less deadly overall in 2020. So whereby they are um, certainly being, let's say, encouraged by some of the motivations of the, of the pandemic, um, we're not seeing a particularly solid trend in one way outside of the US, which you've demonstrated here. Um, there's been a 38% decline in the number of fatalities associated uh, with demonstrations and particularly in the Middle East. 
um, and that's um, driven by a decrease in the lethality in, in Iran and Iraq. Um, because ACLED's coverage of the US does not extend to 2019, although of course, as, as noted in the paper's graphs, I think that we have um, no reason to think that 2019 was anywhere near as active as 2020. Um, the United States, as I mentioned, and this is quite important, it did register the highest number of demonstrations in the world in 2020. Um, and nearly as many as demonstrations as I mentioned, India and Pakistan combined, which is very important, in part because India has often been heralded as a really good crucible of social movement studies, and especially rioting studies because of the sheer number of protests and riots that occur therein. Um, and for that to switch to the US, a very different context where we really should shift our mindset about what exactly is fueling um, social movements that are incredibly localized. Is, um, is I think uh, an excellent opportunity for researchers. So I'm uh, very excited to see this work and work like it coming out. Um, but I did want to mention very clearly that uh, the demonstrations that we've seen increase and perpetuate throughout the crisis have really engaged with governance rather than just been a reaction to governance. Um, and in, in particular, um, you know, governments, as they implemented lockdowns and movement restrictions, protests resurged very much in reaction to that. Um, and in this, initially, this resurgence took the form of direct responses to government mismanagement, which was a huge issue and continues to be an issue in places like Brazil. Um, and then they evolved into a continuation of the social movements that had occurred pre-pandemic. So in some ways, what we might be seeing in the US is there had been almost missing protests around some of the issues that were affecting people locally. And once they became organized over um, issues surrounding coronavirus, we saw that they in fact became much more active in other ways. Um, and I would say that, uh, and this is something again that Rudy Bay mentioned recently, that where, where pandemic protests were very active, of course, throughout the year, but social justice much more so, than pro and anti-Trump election protests simultaneously, we're now seeing um, the Stop the Steal protests really kind of continue into uh, gun control protests, we are likely to continue, and then of course reopening protests. So, um, and those things are moving around um, more than we would think. In fact, one of the things I would like to just demonstrate here is a map of the protests in the U.S., which really are quite widespread. And this is, of course, um, just a, a short indication of February 8th, 2020 to the 19th of February. But one of the things that I wanted to mention is um, this, uh, this particular study that I'm showing you now notes that trends in pandemic related demonstrations are closely correlated with COVID-19 uh, cases, as we noted, with spikes in unrest matching infection waves reported throughout 2020. Um, and the data that we, we collected show that the majority of these demonstrations have been organized around key drivers um, and the risks being felt or experienced by health workers, the safety of prisoners and ICE detainees, anti-restriction mobilization, which we've discussed here, the eviction crisis and school closures. And I would say that two of those, more so than all five, are associated with concerns about economic inequality. Um, and further, there was a report today that found that women believe that their, their, um, their income is likely to have been severely affected as a whole because of the crisis in the US. I think they believe that there's been a, a, a potential 25% decrease that in protest data where women as a group would, would coalesce uh, to protest that. And I think that there's some limitations in thinking about how uh, groups were we're doing advocacy protests rather than just grievance related protests at the same time, whereas, as I mentioned before, several crises uh, co-occurred co within the US, especially around the election and social movements, which will complicate how we understand even a coronavirus protest, which of course, as Bruno mentioned, is tagged as such in the data. So um, I, like I said, overwhelmingly, I am incredibly supportive of work that takes the US as a, a hotbed of political demonstrations and violence much more seriously than it has been in the past, and then tries to apply what we know about unrest to a much more developed context to see if these uh, results hold up. And I think what we find is that as we see in developing states, 
or in states like Ethiopia here, there's there's quite a mix of motivations, um, and in fact, often often down to the extremely localized level. And I will stop there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Um, like I said, these reports are available on the ACLED website um, under both the U.S. Crisis Monitor and the Corona the Coronavirus Conflict Tracker. Thanks. Thank you very much, Klina. Pleasure as usual. Um, I have quite a few questions uh, on Q&A and because we are on time, you, you both been perfect. Uh, I'm gonna allow people to talk and also mention that uh, like Klina mentioned, uh, Rudebeck Kishi who was uh, uh, leading on the US protest study uh, is on the audience. So Rudebeck, if you want to add anything, just drop me a note and I'll unmute you. Um, let me start. So we have now, um, we have four uh, questions that uh, um, uh, so will start us off, and I will admit all of you. So we have Tilman Huning, uh, Romar Geha, Laya Balsells, and Adi Dai. And uh, uh, Tilman, I will uh, please ask your question. I'll, I'll unmute you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for this uh, interesting talk. So I was wondering in one, in basically, um, I have a question regarding your main specification. So you have uh, state weak fixed effects, if I understand this correctly, and then you are identifying the um, basically the the relative effects of increasing inequality on the relationship between stringency and protest probability. Um, and I'm wondering how you can calculate absolute effects here. So essentially, I think this parameter is called beta one. I'm wondering how you can identify this. How can you identify the relationship between just stringency and probability of protests if you have all the state weak effects here. Isn't that varying at the stringency? Is that varying at the state weak level as well? Uh, I will let Bruno answer that, but I, I think it's yes. Uh, uh, Roma Geha, I will please ask a question as well. I'll collect four and then pass on to Bruno and Kina. Roma? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor Clonat. Professor Bruno, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the, indeed, uh, the variables that, that, that you were using in your, in your research. And my, my question is very simple. Can we consider that the political rebellion acts during 2020 were due to the stress generated by the pandemic, or instead they were due to the displeasure of the US citizens who are the political leaders by some some policy facts that that, that affect them, the I don't know the, the Black Lives Matter movement, the struggles between uh, different social groups, and well, is there a way to completely control for the effects of one detonant or the other? Can can we? identify which acts, because we are indeed counting acts of rebellion. Can we uh, identify which one is related to which cause? Thank you very much. And we have a question also from Laya Balsells. Laya, I think I, yep. You mean? Yeah, uh, no, my question is very simple. I was wondering about the robustness of the results uh, with you uh, using uh, other measures for uh, maybe poverty or like, because I mean, I always just wonder if like inequality at the county level is really capturing this kind of like deprivation that you're trying to get at, right? Because like there, you could have like a place where there's just not a lot of inequality at the county level because it's, just, it's a very poor county or it's a very rich county, right? So I was wondering about that. Thanks, Laya. And Aditi? Uh, hi. Yeah, I think my question's already been restated by Romar. I was mostly wondering about, like, how do you record data for different types of protests, like, or uh, protests that are directly a relation from, like, COVID lockdown and regulation versus protests about social justice movements, which have been building up for years and years. Uh, so even within the U.S., how do you distinguish between them when you're putting them in the model? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's an important question uh, we both ask. Uh, I'll pass on uh, to Bruno and then to Klina to add. 
And uh, uh, please keep uh, adding questions to the Q&A button, not the chat button, the Q&A, and, I'll, uh, and hopefully we'll still have time for another round. Bruno. Okay, first of all, I'm sorry, I had the <laughs> connection problems and I lost some uh, questions. So I apologize if I'm not replying to everything, but I will try to, to reply. So the first question, uh, my understanding is, uh, which was the model specification? We are using a county uh, fixed effects and the state per week fixed effects. So this uh, basically will ensure uh, the possibility that we are taking in consideration all the structural conditions of each county uh, to reduce uh, the issue of omitted uh, variable bias. Then I, I lost the second part of uh, the question, sorry. So maybe if you want to ask, yes, Patricia. Uh, Tillman, if you're there, can you add or I can? Uh, yeah, so um, so basically I understand that you can identify all the relative effects. So you can basically say that, you know, with inequality increasing, the effect of stringency on the probability of protest gets larger. And I think that's the kind of main statement of the paper. But you also, I, if I remember correctly, you made some kind of absolute statement. You said if you increase stringency by, I think, a standard deviation, then the probability of protest increases by what not. I, I don't remember the exact number. And I'm wondering how you can identify these absolute effects. Because if I understand your specification correctly, you have country state week, sorry, state by week fixed effects in there, and stringency only varies at the state week level. Is that right? Perhaps I'm yeah. messing up one of the variations. So, I'm, so yeah. all of this will be washed out by the fixed effect. No, you are um, correct because we are taking this number from the interaction of the stringency with the inequality defined at county level. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, the results coming from uh, our uh, our analysis that show that uh, one standard deviation of change in the stringency index in the most unequal areas would lead to an increase in the probability of protests of about six percent. Okay, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think Thanks. then I'm missing this the main statement. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think the second question uh, was also related to the last one. So I will try to, re to, 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 the, to reply to the last questions. We basically, uh, with uh, our work, try to specifically identify the COVID-related protest events. And this is possible thanks to the AGLED uh, data because I reported the actors' motivations behind the protests and so on. So in our paper, we clearly identified the protests related to COVID, and we used uh, uh, three, four different words for identifying them, such as virus, pandemic, restrictions, lockdown, uh, and also distinguish these types of uh, protests from uh, other uh, uh, types of protests, such as uh, those related to Black Lives Matter movements or uh, protests against Trump, protests against uh, referred to the presidential elections. And uh, following up also on the point of uh, Cleon, we, uh, uh, I think we tried to do a nice exercise in our paper because we replaced basically the main dependent variables, uh, so the protest. Uh, uh, related to COVID uh, with the other types of protests. And the results are completely different. So we basically show in the paper that the stringency tend to reduce the probability of these uh, different types of protests. So our main conclusion in this exercise is that uh, stringency, the stringency of uh, policy related to COVID uh, tend to increase the probability of uh, protests related to COVID in the most unequal uh, area. And then uh, uh, again, I think the uh, point of Laila, uh, if we try to look uh, uh, about uh, different uh, uh, economic factors to replace inequality with uh, uh, maybe poverty, uh, no, we didn't do that so far. I think this could be a nice uh, exercise. The main point about inequality is that uh, uh, the, 
I think it's uh, especially in developing the economies, inequality matters uh, because uh, basically uh, the, the, also the way in which uh, poverty is measured is more in terms in relative terms in terms of changes uh, in comparison to median income and so on. So uh, we focused on inequality because it's one of the big issue in our society and in the USA society. But uh, we will uh, for sure take in consideration this um, very nice suggestion we will use also poverty tax. Yeah, th thanks very much. Klina, uh, would you like to add? Or Rudabe, if you're there. Thanks very much, I'd be happy to. And Rudabe, in fact, would be the expert on this. Um, but there was a very rigorous system set up to distinguish the tenor and the characteristics of each of the protests. And in fact, as Bruno has alluded to, in the notes category of every single event of which there are several, several thousand, uh, we note whether or not the protest was directly related to one of these main characteristics that defined US protests in the, in the uh, 2020 period. Um, social justice being an entirely separate category to the coronavirus related work um, or coronavirus related um, episodes, uh, the stop the steal episodes, the pro and anti Trump episodes, the you know precursor to the election episodes. It's, uh, it's not it's not too difficult to distinguish what a protest is about when you have an incredibly information rich environment to support it. It gets much more difficult when you're using one source and it's about something that happened in um, you know, a remote area of southern Iran, it becomes much more easier when it's happening in Tallahassee and it's reported about 50 times and you can confirm all sorts of details. Um, but again, Rudabe would be, uh, would be the perfect person to address this. And there are several different methodology, exhaustive methodology documents about the US project that I would encourage anybody to read if they have any questions about how that was done. Great. Um... Ruda, we're probably putting you on the spot, but if you'd like to come in, I have unmuted you. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thanks for including me. And thanks for, um, I think you did justice to, to all the work we've been doing, Kleena. Those were, uh, that was a great presentation by, by both panelists. Um, so in, in terms of the, the point of protests um, or the drivers, I guess, as Kleena says, I mean, in some context, where you know the media environment is so robust like in the US it can be somewhat simpler to deduce those things as opposed to you know like the example of rural Iran I mean it can sometimes all we have from a source um, especially given Akhled, uh, you know relies so heavily on secondary sources it can be difficult to know what drivers were that said um, it's an entire uh, new can of worms to try to understand what exactly drivers or protests are, especially could, given that individuals can be motivated by a variety of factors to show up and um, take to the streets. Um, in some of the, the work in those reports, I mean, some kind of some types of protests can fall, of course, uh, within different groupings, right? Someone that is against coronavirus restrictions might be against a mask mandate, but they also might be against um, school closures. And so the school closures one might also fall under um, the categorization around schools. And so we did try to go through and, and categorize these different protests um, uh, you know, they're not mutually exclusive and they can be part of different ones to understand the, the trends that drive um, each of those separate drivers. Um, I think part of this is why, um, you know, ACLED hasn't till, you know, still hasn't formally introduced a protest driver variable or category given the difficulties in, in deducing those things. I mean, I think even grappling with something like I don't know, a BLM protest, is that about minority rights? Is that about state brutality? Is that about something else? I mean, and we can kind of divvy up these things in a variety of ways. So those are actually some of the things we're currently grappling with at, at ACLED as we work on a pilot um, around protest motivation. So I think these are really um, important questions that uh, I, I promise you we are weighing up and down and sideways these days as we take on that work. Thank you very much, and uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the work on motivations for protests is, uh, I mean, it, there's quite a bit out there, but it's it's been very difficult to theorize and also spot patterns across different contexts. And uh, Kleena mentioned before, 
about how uh, a lot of us working on protests have been focusing on you know areas where there's been lots of them like india for instance or even the early history in the us and in latin america but there's still a lot to be done here um I, I'll, uh, I'll take advantage of my uh, chair position to uh, actually ask Kalina um, a, a question along those lines. You did mention before that the US is bringing out, or, or the, what we're observing currently in the US is bringing out uh, new empirical uh, patterns that could be quite useful for theorizing further about protest motivation and the origins of social movements. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that. And I have also a question here from Ricardo. Ricardo, uh, Ricardo Santos. Uh, I will unmute you now, Ricardo. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Bruno and Quina, for a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, Bruno, I was wondering about so if if there would be a space to explore. Um, wondering about the nature of inequality and specifically if it would be possible to assess whether within group inequality and between group inequalities have different rules. I was kind of thinking instead of using Cheney, using a, a decomposable index that, that could allow us for, allow you to do that and then check whether that, whether that would be interesting. Over. Thank you. And uh, 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 I'll pass on then to Bruno and then now we just have a few minutes left so uh bruno yeah uh, thanks Ricardo. it's a very interesting uh, point I, we didn't uh, check about group inequalities uh, and i think this is uh, um, we just focus on economic inequality just on vertical inequality but i think this could be another uh, way of uh, uh, understanding uh, the role of inequality and explaining uh, the relationship between uh, the implementation of these policies, policies and uh, the increasing number of protests. Thanks a lot for this suggestion. Uh, I'm happy. Great, great. Um, so with regard to new work on the US, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of space to discuss the effects of populism and the shape it takes within um, different contexts. So uh, recently we wrote a paper talking about how much of the conflict in the Sahel is in, is in many ways using a pastoralist populism to generate um, quite a lot of social uh, support for the for the different jihadist groups there. And I think that populism is something that can be eminently flexible to different political contexts. And we're seeing, of course, that um, that take a hold in the states. Although after the January 6th insurrection, uh, I think that people are a little bit less likely to be as open about it as they had previously been about the about specifically militia behavior and how that's encouraging people to go from demonstrations towards more organized forms of engagement. Um, but we are taking a close look at it. We've just released, I think yesterday, a discussion about the Proud Boys and their structure and organization and all the rest of it and how that might affect uh, future violence within the US context. But Ruta Bay, again, is uh, spearheading those US-based efforts. So if she would like to, yet again, in fact, probably a better person for this panel than me. No, I, I doubt better. Um, but some of the US work that, uh, that we're taking on now, we're, um, we've been really interested in understanding how different um, brands or mantles can be used by a lot of these, uh, you, these, these groups. I mean, we look at the right um, in quotes so often in the US context, but you know, it's important to remember that they're not um, a monolith, right? And, and we've seen organization early last year, for example, around um, anti-coronavirus kind of restrictions and mask mandates and, and the like, then we saw um, organization by uh, many of these right-wing groups that were engaged in those types of things, you know, after having built new networks and coalitions, engaging in the BLM protests. Um, in, in the fall, we saw this kind of mutate more towards the Stop the Steal movement, much more direct involvement by these types of groups and militias 
in, in demonstrations. Um, and, and since then, I mean, like the, the insurrection that Kalina mentioned, I mean, we, we did see a lot of these named groups laying low for a while, but they have started to come back out of the woodwork now. And we're seeing many of these groups um, engaging again around whether it's um, COVID restrictions, but also around other mantles, whether it's um, anti-vaccine movements, whether it's around the Second Amendment in the US. And we're seeing uh, different kind of brands being taken by these groups and co-opted and, and used to help them in networking, used to help them in attracting new entities to join these types of um, and these broader kind of mantles allow for a, a variety of different types of entities. And so as a result, we've been seeing you know, a, a really serious proliferation of these types of militia groups and non-state actors in the US. Um, and so we expect to continue seeing this and we expect to see, especially as we're beginning to see some movement around um, Second Amendment kind of conversations in the US, especially as we're starting to unfortunately see more of these mass shootings, especially as uh, COVID restrictions begin to be lifted, that will be much more part of the conversation. And it was is very likely that we'll again see um, organization around those types of um, branding by these types of groups. So I think it's really important to understand these these militia groups, which are you know quite proliferate, um, at, you know, like a lot of other contexts. I mean, I think uh, you know, Kalina was um, the the point she made about this American exceptionalism and how it's important to kind of look at the U.S. alongside all the others is really a point we try to underline, which is why the end of the U.S. crisis monitor work, the U.S. data collection is now part of Backlit's you know quote unquote regular data coverage, and so now the U.S. is um, yet another country that we cover at ACLA. And I just wanted to mention here that what we're looking for as being a particularly dangerous context is uh, is where the grievance of these populations, which are manifold, as we've just uh, as we've just heard, uh, become aligned with elite grievances about accessing accessing power. Um, that's when they are at their most difficult, when they both have representation in formal roles and they have a, a support group that they can come back on. And I think that um, January 6th is a very classic interpretation of how um, you have elite representation in, in the former president. And then you had uh, groups believing that they were effectively there to do his bidding. Um, and that became, that became a much bigger issue and a much more violent context than it would normally have done. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Sadly, we're coming to the end of our time here. Uh, but I think what um, this bringing all this together, what this is showing us is yet again, Although we're probably living through, we're definitely living through a new pandemic. We don't have a lot of experience dealing with these issues, but it's yet again a massive shock, which is magnifying problems that were happening already before. We had the rise of inequalities. We had uh, a variety of uh, cultural backlash type discourses. We, we had a, a series of losers and winners from process of globalization and so forth. We have issues around gender and minority discrimination, and those are being amplified. And what we're seeing here is they amplify to the extent they actually result, resulting in some cases in quite uh, in forms of political violence. And also, I think one of the things that this shows, especially uh, from Cleaners and um, and Rue Bess Lakers intervention is uh, the, 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 the distinction between developed countries and developing countries and how these movements and these, these uh, various groups form is becoming quite narrow. So I do, you know, we, we're talking about, Rue Bess was just talking about militia groups in the Sahel, militia groups in the US, and I presume the formation of these groups are not so different and uh, the structural mechanisms explaining their, uh, why these groups become salient at, at certain times and are used by political elites in a variety of ways um, is, is happening all over the world and not just in certain parts. So um, this was one of the motivations why we actually thought it was very interesting to take a leap forward and, and look at the US. Also really great to hear that ACLED will continue collecting data in the US. Uh, I was uh, a bit disappointed when I thought that the, it was just a one year project, but that's really great to hear because obviously these things are gonna be really important. Uh, also like Bruno mentioned, we only observing very immediate if effects, right? So um, I think we need to come back in sort of three, four, five years down the road and see what implications all these different 
uh, changes will have for political systems more broadly. I mean, in terms of this will have implications in terms of discussing things around uh, the survival of democracy and uh, and whether some of these protests um, uh, translate into higher levels of violence in different parts of the world and so forth. So I hope I'm, I'll be able to invite you all in the five years time to <laughs> reflect on this again. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much, uh, Kleiner from Addis and Bruno from Maastricht and uh, Rhoda Beer for <laughs> last moment, moment intervention in Prompto. Uh, thank you very much to all and thank you for everyone that uh, for your questions and for staying with us until now. Take care and see you soon again. Thanks Patricia. Bye. Bye-bye.